the Bible says, for in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. I'm going to read that again. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers of his word. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, God gave me this message and it's funny because whenever I get a word from the Lord, uh, I always try to ask God, what's the timing on it? But he gave me this message, and I don't know about many of you, but as we were ending last year and we were coming to the close of the last quarter, there was a lot of different things that we were experiencing and what we see as God was pruning us. Anybody went through that pruning process? Raise your hand if you went through pruning. Amen. Pruning happens to us all, but we see it in different phases more times than not. And so as we got toward the end of the last quarter, we saw uh, that God was really preparing us for what we needed to, to be and how we needed to respond as we were entering into a new year. Now, when I got this message, though, the Lord gave me clarity. Um, many of us really don't know why we suffer. You know, suffering, affliction, adversity is a way of life for many people. It happens to everyone. But many of us don't really understand why it happens. I know we're Christian and the politically correct Christian thing to say is, well, you know, God must be testing me. Right. But the reality is that many of us don't really have a good explanation for why we go through what we go through. And I've learned that when you really don't know why, you always are left with the figment of doubt. Are y'all awake in here? And the Bible lets us know that anything not done in faith is sin. So the reality is that a lot of times we doubt God because we're questioning God in our subconscious. We're not really sure about if God is really with us in certain moments or why God is allowing certain things to happen. And so there's a lot of question marks that we have. But I came today to give you clarity on why we must suffer. Suffering, it can be seen in many different elements. But the, the thing that I'm going to begin with is this. Jesus is God. That's not a question. It's a statement. It's the truth. Jesus is God. He always has been and he always will be. Somebody say yes. yes. And because we know that Jesus is God, when we look at our Christian walk, we have to look at Jesus as the example. Yes. And when we look at Jesus as the example, what I found is that Jesus was perfected through suffering. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, I want you to read it with me because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So let's read this to the, get together. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, CSB says this. Let's ready, read. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The pioneer of our salvation is Jesus Christ. It's not a question. He pioneered our salvation. But he was not perfected until he went through suffering. Jeremiah, the thing I love about this is that God told me that although Jesus is God, he was not qualified to be the savior for humanity until he suffered with humanity. Are y'all awake in here? Many of us think that just because Jesus is God, that what he went through on earth was nothing to him. But that's erroneous because the Bible lets us know that every way that we are tempted, he was tempted as well. Yet he did what? Sinned not. I want to give clarity to this. It's so important to know that Jesus did not sin. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Because if he did not sin, that means it's possible for us to live free from sin. Are y'all awake in here? Many people preach that I'm a sinner saved by grace. Well, that's still walking in that old identity because the Bible tells me that if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New. Old things have passed away. All things have become. So if I'm still claiming sinner, I'm still walking in my old identity. Are y'all still with me? We often hear preachers say that as in trying to help people know that you're going to mess up. Well, we know that because I'm still in, in flesh. 
bodily form. But the reality is that the more I walk in the spirit, the less sin finds me. Are y'all still with me? You know, Jesus suffered because he came in the form of a man. And he was born like you and I as a baby. And he had to walk through his walk as a person, as a human being, just like the people that he made. Now, the thing that God gave me here is the, the, the phrase perfect through suffering. Somebody say perfection, perfection. through sufferings. Perfection. Take notes right here. Perfection is not obtainable absent of suffering. Perfection is not obtainable absent of suffering. You can be good at a thing, but you won't be perfected unless you suffer. This is the blueprint that is put into the universe, put into the atmosphere. God made it this way because he would not allow us to go a different way than he went. Are y'all still with me? Perfection through suffering. Now, the word suffering, if you're still taking notes, is the Greek word pathema. P-A-T-H-E-M-A. -E pathema. And it means Affliction or adversity. Pathema. So when we hear the word suffering, it's a Greek word that means affliction or adversity. So in this text, when you hear the pioneer of their salvation was made perfect through sufferings, it means that Jesus was made perfect through affliction and adversity. Y'all still awake in here? And the word adverse in the Merriam-Webster dictionary means against or contrary to. Now, the first sermon that I preached this year was the sermon called Keep Your Eyes On Jesus. And in that sermon, what I said was when Peter and, and, and the disciples were in the boat, the winds were what to them? Do y'all remember? The word I used was specifically from the verse contrary. And I said to each and every one of you without elaborating further, I didn't know why I wasn't elaborating. Now I know God wanted me to preach something separate for that specific thing. But I said contrary means in opposition against someone, something or direction. And whenever you come into a place of transition, you are going to face contrary. The Bible lets us know that Jesus was perfected through suffering and suffering is the Greek word for affliction and adversity and adverse means to be in opposition or contrary to something. This means that when you face adversity, what you're really dealing with is something that is going against your flow of life. It's going against your specific purpose. It's going against your specific function. It's adverse to you. Are y'all still with me? Now, in that text I taught about in Keep Your Eyes on Jesus, I explained to you that Jesus used adversity to show Peter where he needed to grow. Peter had immaculate faith while he was in the boat. His faith was increasing about the 5,000 being fed. He believed God when God said, come out on the water and walk. But when he saw winds that were contrary to his walking on water, his faith immediately revealed where it had not grown. What am I explaining to you? I'm explaining to you that even though you may be perfected in this previous season, you must be perfected in this current one. Humans do not like pain. I don't care what you say. Some people say I have a high pain tolerance, but nobody really likes pain because many people that have high pain tolerance aren't able to take pain when it comes in an emotional, mental or spiritual sense. Just because you like getting tattoos does not mean you like your heart being broken. Let me teach you. Just, hey, Lord, have mercy. Just because you are the type of person that will say, oh, yeah, I got to work out harder until I feel it burn. Doesn't mean you like to work out harder in the spirit because some of us can't pray for the past 15 minutes. Somebody say, yeah. So the reality is that nobody in their right mind really likes pain because real pain is what you don't like. Lord, Lord, let me help you in here. If you like it, it's not pain. Uh, some of us have become so accustomed to pain that we say we like it in order to give ourselves a psychological defense mechanism once it happens. If you're accustomed to heartbreak, then you don't believe in love so that you won't be heartbroken when love doesn't find you again. Somebody say amen. 
I'm in the house. Some of, some of us, we, we're so used to friends being fickle that we don't put faith in nobody. So we say, I don't trust nobody. It's not that you don't really trust nobody. You feel like you can't trust anybody. So your defense mechanism is up so that you won't be disappointed when what normally happens, happens. This is adversity. Yeah, let me help you right here. Because you revealing that pattern shows that Satan has tried to come and perfect adversity in your life that was meant to perfect your character. Lord have mercy in here. Demonic patterns reveal Satan perfecting himself in our lives versus us being perfected by what was sent to test us. Are y'all still with me? Somebody say we got to stop the pattern. And so, in Romans chapter 5, this is where we're going to go now. Romans 5. We're going to continue our text. Turn to Romans 5, verse 1, CSB. We're going to stay in the Christian Standard Bible for a while. Romans chapter 5, we're going to start at verse 1. I'll give you time to get there. Son, do you mind? Come and twist this for me, please. Romans chapter 5, verse number 1. This is where it really gets good, Jeremiah. I really dive into this thing now. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, CSB. If you're there, say amen. amen. The Bible says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. This is where it gets a little hairy. And not only that, but we also boast in our what? Afflictions. afflictions. Because we know that affliction produces what? Endurance. Endurance produces proven what? Character. And proven character produces what? Hope. This hope will not what? It's My God in heaven. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I'm going to really dive into it right here. When you see the word affliction, affliction and adversity are interchangeable. I'm going to help you. Because affliction is a Greek word, philipsis. And in this text, it means trouble or tribulation. Mm -hmm. And the adversity is a difficult situation or condition. It can also be referenced as a misfortune or a tragedy. So these two words are interchangeable. When you see adversity and affliction, both are used to perfect you. There are things that happen that are tragic, but there is perfection that can come from tragedy. Let me explain this to you. It's very difficult to console people that have been through grief if I've never grieved. It's very difficult to teach about walking in the spirit if I don't have any experience doing that because I'm always in my flesh. It's very difficult to speak to people about the effects of divorce if I've never been divorced. Through every misfortune, there is perfection that can be obtained. The saints don't like me right now. But the reality is, this is the way God designed it, because God is not the author of evil. I, I got to help you here. God is not the author of evil, but he causes all things to work together, even evil, for the good of them who are called and according to his purpose. And what's the most important part? What do they do? They love him. See, Lord have mercy in here. I've learned that half of what I went through in my life was not God's plan for my life. But, oh, I'm trying to stay CCM right now. Listen to me. It's not God's plan for my life, but he used it to perfect me. And now I can minister to people who also inherited things that were not God's plan for their life. God didn't want me to gangbang, but I gangbang. So now I have a ministry to the gangbanger. See, you, you, I'm going to help you in here. You, you, listen to me. God didn't want me to get arrested, but I got arrested. And now I'm able to minister to people who have been through court cases and been to jail and understand what that looks like. I've learned that people put more stock in people that have been through something they've been through than people who talk a lot about stuff they have no real knowledge about. You see, I can minister to white-collar Christians. Uh -huh. And Christians that aren't so Christian. 
Y'all know what I'm talking about. I can minister to people that's on this side of the fence and minister to people that's on that side of the fence. Because I have been on both sides of the fence. But it doesn't make a difference now because I'm on this side of the fence. I'm standing in the will of God. And what I've learned about being in the will of God is that when you are in the will of God, he perfects your path for you. The Bible says that God orders the steps of a man. And the Bible says he delights in the paths of the godly. And so as long as I'm standing in God's will, I'm protected. Even if the devil touched me, he can't prosper. We know that Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon that is formed against me shall what? Prosper. That doesn't mean it's not going to affect you. That doesn't mean it's not going to hinder you from some things. That doesn't mean it's not going to delay you in some areas. It just means that the original intent of the weapon will not come to fruition. Somebody shout he's covering me. So we see in verse 3 that the Bible says we boast in our afflictions because oh, oh Lord have mercy because we know affliction produces endurance and endurance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. I'm going to stop right there. One of the prime examples of what going through affliction looks like is Joseph. Joseph, loved by his father, loved by his mother, hated by his brothers. Why was he hated? Because he was favored. Can I say this to you? Favor is not fair. But it's still favor. And things that aren't fair make people look at you funny. My God in heaven. What they didn't understand as that the reason why Joseph was so beloved by his family was because Joseph came, Lord have mercy, Joseph came from an unfavorable situation. His birth signified that God was still with Jacob, Lord have mercy. And his birth made Jacob say, I'm going to treasure what God gave me just the same way that Abraham treasured what Isaac came through. Lord have mercy. Can I help you here? But the difference between Joseph and Isaac is that when ja uh, Isaac's brother had problems with him, he was sent away. When Jacob's uh, children had problems with his promised child, they stayed. Sometimes you're not experiencing adversity because you're not really in a situation where adversity can touch you. When Job went through what he went through, he was only allowed because God's hedge was no longer around him. God was proving a point to the enemy. But he proved the point to the enemy not because he wanted to. He proved the point to the enemy because all things work together. Can I break something open for you? The Bible lets us know why Job went through what he went through. Job said, the thing that I feared came upon me. And the thing I greatly feared has come unto me. Do you know that fear is a magnet for trouble? Some of you are going through what you're going through because you deep down fear the thing before it comes. So when it happens, your fear dragged it near. That's the demonic law of attraction. I'm going to help you in here. I hope they listen to me, Caleb. Fear is a demonic accelerant for whatever the enemy has planned for you. This is why there's only really not many references to what not having we should not have besides the flesh. But the Bible lets us know in 2 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given you a spirit of fear. Why is that so important? Because fear is a demonic magnet for the rest of the enemy. Are y'all still with me? Y'all yeah. still away? Yeah. Somebody say, I shall not fear. You got a decree and declare. So Joseph, back to Joseph. Joseph went through adversity. Now the thing is, is he went through adversity at home. And then he got sold into slavery. He had favor from God and favor from man, but he was sold into adversity. While in adversity, his favor still was active. I'm going to teach right here. Some of you are going through things and yet the hand of God is still on your life. Amen. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Because if it wasn't there, you wouldn't be here. Lord, have mercy. Some of you are here only because of the, can I say this? Every last one of us here are only here because of the grace of God. God is still on your life. If you're still allowed to tell me about your troubles, then just know trouble ain't going to last for you. I'm here to let you know. Because what the devil does is he takes out people who God's hand is not on. But whoever God's hand is on, he can't snuff them out. Somebody say, I'm covered. 
I'm going to show you how that works. Joseph was sold into slavery because what was originally intended for him did not prosper. Can I help you? The Bible says that they were actually going to kill him. And another brother spoke up and said, let's just sell him. What? Oh, Lord, have mercy. The original intent was death, but no weapon formed against me shall. I'm trying to help y'all in here. So now he's sold into slavery and he's over Potiphar's house. He's a servant first. And then his work ethic and the gifts that God has given him and the favor of God upon him sparks the attention of man. And now Potiphar says, I want you to be in charge of all of my house. A man trusts his slave to be in charge of his house. Somebody say favor ain't fair. Watch me. How you handle adversity determines your promotion. If Joseph had got upset, irate, started down talking God, we wouldn't have seen no promotion in Potiphar's house. Because promotion only comes when your character is being perfected and you get through it. Hello, somebody. The Bible lets us know that exaltation and all of these things is in the hand of the Lord. The Lord puts kings in place and takes them out. Isn't that what it said? So promotion is in the hands of who? Even if Satan wanted to happen, if God said it ain't going to happen, it don't happen. Somebody say yes. So Joseph handled his adversity well, and then we see promotion. Watch me. Now he gets promoted, and now he goes through another adverse situation. He gets promoted, and because of his favor and his good looks, now the woman is attracted to him when she should be attracted to her husband. <laughs> Somebody say favor brings problems. If he was still a mere servant, a slave only, with no promotion, she probably wouldn't have blinked twice at the boy. But now he's running everything in Potiphar's house, probably better than Potiphar, and now she's like, mm, that boy from Israel looked good. She tried to lie with him. We know what that means. Yeah. Amen. Amen. She wanted to lay with that boy. And he refused her. And the Bible says one day she called him. And she said, come lie with me. And what does the Bible say Joseph did? Joseph did what? He ran. But he ran so fast she got a piece of his clothing in her hand. Watch me. And now... He's being accused of rape when really what she was trying to get him to do was commit adultery. Stay with me. What I've learned is sometimes adversity comes because you did the right thing. Y'all wasn't ready. I hope y'all taking notes. I really do. Sometimes adversity ain't just the devil. It's coming because you did the right thing. And when you do the right thing, the devil get mad because you didn't do the wrong thing. So he attacks you because of your right decision. You asking God why you going through hell because you're in his will. I'm, well, y'all ain't saying nothing to me. I'm going through what I'm going through because God's hand is upon me. And the devil don't like me. Oh, well, because trouble don't last all the way. Somebody say I'm covered. I felt that in my spirit. That was a deep Negro spiritual day. That was, dang. <laughs> You're in his will. Somebody say, I'm in his will. I'm in his will. So he decides not to sin, and now he's being assaulted. His character is being slandered. Potiphar throws him in jail with no explanation. No, pr no prison, actually. No explanation. Right? Now watch this. He goes to prison. While in prison, for years, he's there. Let me teach you something. Some of us want our season of adversity to end quickly. That's not always the way it goes. Because God is perfecting you. Lord have mercy in here. I'm sure that the reason why he was there as long as he was there because God was perfecting something in him during those years. See what I've learned about adversity is that certain adversity we understand. But other adversity we get an attitude with God about. We be like why did you let this happen to me? How dare you? I was serving you. I love you. And this is what you did to me. Please remember God is not the author of well, amen. But he's also not the author of, according to the text, this is where we had in the time. I love, they love the Bible. Can't let them, somebody say, my saints know the Bible. Amen. Uh, but God is not the author of evil. So this is, was not God's plan. But God had a plan in the midst of Satan's plan. Can I help you? you? You see, he went to prison and he's upset. And then guess what God does? God, oh Lord have mercy, calls his number while he's in an adverse situation. Lord have mercy. These two men have a dream. 
from Pharaoh's house where he's supposed to go. Lord, have mercy. Some of you are going to miss your divine appointment if you keep trying to run out of your refining process. God's trying to send you to the palace. You're trying to run out of prison. The prison is the road to the palace. Oh, my God. In here. You need to stay on the path that you're in because if you don't go through this adversity, you're not going to be prepared for your promotion. Somebody say, I need to be prepared. Lord, have mercy. Can you please get my rag out of that bag? Lord, have mercy. Watch this. The Bible says that these men, they were in prison with him and they had two dreams. Both of them. They had a dream of peace. And they come and they talk in their dreams out loud. The other one, the uh, first, first pocket, big pocket. And um, they talk the dreams out loud. It just said, I can interpret. How many of you going to use the gift God gave you when God seems to have abandoned you? When you're in your wilderness, do you still stir up the gift or do you let the gift go dormant because you ain't happy with your wilderness season? Just because you're in adversity doesn't mean God don't want to use you no more. As a matter of fact, we really find out what you're made of in the midst of your situation. Let me help you. Because anybody can prophesy when the world is going good. But who will prophesy the word of the Lord when COVID outside? Who will prophesy the word of the Lord when they putting chips in people? Who will prophesy? Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Who will prophesy what God really told them when the rest of the world is going against the word that they heard from God? See, I will that who you really are is revealed in the midst of adversity. And I don't know about you, but every deliverer is refined and perfected and produced in the midst of adversity. It's a deliverer. Joseph gets told about the dreams and he tells them the interpretation. Watch me. <laughs> he tells them the interpretation and then at the end he says, and when you get back to Pharaoh's house, don't forget about me. In other words, he was also prophetic. Somebody say he was prophetic. He knew that whatever God showed him in the dreams, because he was a seer prophet. See, y'all weren't ready for that. Because he was a seer prophet, he knew it was going to come to pass. Lord, have mercy. So he knew they was going to make it back to the palace, but he was hoping he could make it with them. Let me explain something to you. Just because you made a connection in your tribulation does not mean they're going to be able to help you get out of your situation. <laughs> It can't happen until the appointed time. Somebody say the appointed time. He said, don't forget about me. And that man forgot about him for another year. Too. <laughs> and it, it was one to three years. I'm not looking right now. He had forgot about him for a year to three years. Forgot. Three years, right? Forgot. That's sad. But not really, because he tried to skip the furnace. Lord have mercy. Joseph said, I did good, God, so I'm going to get promoted now. God said, yes, but there's still a little more perfecting in your character I got to bring. Because you can't become a ruler over an entire nation and not be perfected for national ruler level. You got, Lord have mercy. Maybe at the point where he asked the baker to remember, I mean, excuse me, the cupbearer to remember was the level where he would have been good on a city level or good on a, a region level. But God went and perfect him on national level. Level. And some of you said, I'm called to the nations. Duh. That's why you're going through national adversity. Um, God called me to India, Asia, Africa, and the UK. Good. You're about to go through India, Asia, African, and UK tribulation. Uh-huh. God ain't send you nowhere where you ain't tried for. Huh? Somebody say yes. Turn the floor monitors down for me a little bit. It, 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 just it. Okay. Watch this. So he gets forgotten about and God's perfecting him. Can I be real with you? I was like, dang, God, <laughs> you forgot about him again. <laughs> right? But God revealed to me this. God didn't forget Joseph. God was perfecting Joseph. Yes. All things work together. All things. Your point in time don't expedite just because you wanted to. Your appointed time comes when you get the lesson you're supposed to learn. See, some things I can't skip past, and other things I can skip past once I get it. Y'all weren't ready. Acceleration is also in the hand of the Lord. Oh, Lord, have mercy. But adversity shows me if I'm ready to obtain it. Now, 
He gets down there to the palace. Now finally, they call him up. The man finally remembers. Lord have mercy. I wonder why he remembered now. God brings things to people's remembrance. Lord have mercy. And now he remembers and he says, oh yeah, there's a man in prison who's the reason why I'm even here. Lord have mercy. He can interpret your dream. Pharaoh has a need. Can I say something to you? Many of you want to be catapulted into your assignment, but you're not needed yet. Because the dream of a soldier wouldn't have got J Joseph out of prison. Lord have mercy. God needed him to be needed in Egypt because there was no other way they were going to listen to a foreigner. And God said, I'm not bringing you out till there's a need for you. Because where you're needed, you'll be celebrated. I'm going to talk to you in here. Pharaoh had a dream that he couldn't interpret. The wise men couldn't interpret. All solutions had failed. And God said, now I'm going to bring out my boy. Because my boy has been perfected, tried, and tested for this. Now it's time for my light to shine in Egypt. And I'm going to use an Israeli. Somebody say, my time is coming. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm trying. That whole Person is out the window. I'm trying, but I gotta preach the way I preach. Amen. Watch me. Look here. He gets there to that palace and he interprets this dream. And Pharaoh says, Good. Let's uh let's uh do your plan. And then he promotes him on the spot. No background check. No resume, no major recommendation. You're my answer to my problem. Promotion. Are y'all still listening? I don't care how many job resumes you put on LinkedIn. I don't care how many resume, uh, uh, you know, resumes you done drafted. I don't care how many recommendations you have from corporate people. Until the appointed time, you ain't going where you're supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> Resumes don't perfect you. Adversity does. Recommendations don't perfect you. Tribulation does. Y'all listening? He got promoted because it was his time. Can I say something to you? And before he got promoted, can I say this to you? When God brings you in a space where you're supposed to be, don't ask where the provision going to come from. They're going to take care of it. Because when they brought him out of the prison, they cleaned him up before they brought him before the king. Oh, listen to me. They cleaned him up, shaved him, put new clothes on him. In other words, you ain't going to look like what you've been through. Oh, I'm going to run out of here. God's about to promote me, and I ain't even going to look like the hell I just went through. You, you, oh, I'm going to say something to you in here. God promote you, he clean you up, provide the budget, and put you in the limo. You ain't got the money for it, he already know that. He provided a way of escape for you. Somebody say, he's my provider. Lord, have mercy. So he gets promoted, but he was perfected. Watch me. When troubles come, how we respond determines what we produce. There's a saying that says, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. I'm a boy, right? But the thing I've learned is that trouble of any kind is lemons. They're sour. Watch me, watch me, watch me, watch me. I hope, please take notes. Don't do to take notes. Trouble of any kind is lemons. It's sour. Any kind. But Christ-like character is the sugar. It's sweet. And when you put something sour with something sweet, it's acceptable. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. When you have the character of Christ that's been perfected through your adversity, you add sugar to your lemons. And the water you need is the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the living water. So when you put it all together, you have exactly what you need to make a bad situation turn good. Are y'all still with me? I know that's a simple analogy, but I need you to get it. The Bible lets us know in John chapter 7 that the Holy Spirit is the living water. It says, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And then the next verse says, Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 4, Jesus tells the woman, anyone who believes in me, he's going to have what? Living water. What was he talking about? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is necessary for life. Because the Holy Spirit empowers believers to do life. You can't get through adversity without power from the Holy Ghost. You understand what I said? The Holy Ghost empowers you to overcome tribulation. 
Lord have mercy. I'm not going to stay here. Now, put this down. Adversity happens to everyone, including believers. I'm going to teach. Adversity happens to everyone, including believers. Write this, ver write this chapter down. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2 through 4. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2 through 4. Write it down. NASB 95. You can read it later. But the Bible says this. Paul said, And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one will be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. Wait a minute. Hold on, Apostle. You mean to tell me I've been destined for affliction? Absolutely. God saw it before it happened. Remember, he wrote your story, so he saw what was going in it. Lord have mercy. And verse 4 says, For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know. Leaders who don't prep their people about tribulation ain't good leaders. If your leader make you feel like it's going to always be good in Christ, he lied. She lied. Not true. You can have peace in the midst of the storm, but the peace may not always be external. Jesus was sleeping in the boat when the storm was raging. He didn't have peace because it was peaceful outside. He had peace because he is peace. And when it get hectic outside and it look gray in the world around you, you got to have something on the inside of you that's better than what's going on around you. I don't have peace because everything good outside and everybody healthy. I got peace because the Prince of Peace is my portion. I'm going to talk to you right here. I reside in peace, Tasia. So because I'm in God, peace is my portion. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Somebody say peace is my portion. Watch me. Affliction in this text, though, is not in regards to life's troubles. Affliction in this text actually means persecution because of Christ. There's a difference. Life happens to us all. But there's also affliction we're going to face because we chose Jesus. Somebody say yes. yes. Let me show you how I know that. John chapter 15 verse 18 through 20 CSB. Turn there really quickly. John chapter 15 verse 18 through 20 CSB. John 15, verse 18 through 20, CSB. If you're there, say amen. amen. It says, if the world, this is Jesus speaking in red. If the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world does what? Hate. Hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep. So in other words, Jesus said being hated by people because of choosing me is inevitable. It's normal. My prerogative is if don't nobody not like you, you might not really be with God. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Because Jesus said it. But what should be our response to that? Our response should be to be happy. Happy. Happy about tribulation? Absolutely. Jesus said that also. Luke 6, verse 22 through 23 says, blessed are you. Hear what I say, verbiage. Jesus said, blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. Rejoice in that day, not be sad, and leap for joy. For indeed, your reward is great in where? Heaven. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. What is God saying here? You got to learn to be happy about bad things happening because bad things happening meaning you're on the right side of the fence. Can I say something to you? If you're going through trouble and you don't feel God, that's when you know you're in trouble. Stay with me, please. If I go 
through something, Jeremiah, as long as God is with me, I'm covered. Grace will keep me. But if I go through something, Khalil, and God ain't with me, I want to know the difference because what's sin against me will take me under. Y'all hear what I said? Yeah. It's just like the law of sowing and reaping. I was speaking to one of my spiritual daughters, and she brought up the point again today to me. I forgot. I told her this. But sowing and reaping is a spiritual law. You can't bypass it. So if you sow evil, you're going to reap evil. If you sow negative, you're going to reap negative. Some of us are reaping what we sowed before we came to Christ. But because we have Christ, there's some level of grace. It's like an umbrella. It's still going to rain, but we got an umbrella so I ain't as wet as I would have been if I didn't have it. Y'all still awake? Some things ain't the devil. We reaping what we sow. But you'll know that too. Because when you ask God why, he'll say, you're reaping. What I've learned is I can't rebuke my reaping season. Lord have mercy. But I can ask God for strength to get through it. See, your Lord have mercy. My God in heaven. I can't rebuke my reaping season, but I can rebuke the demon that's trying to torment me while I reap. You, you don't, y'all ain't listen to what I say. I'm, oh, Lord have mercy. Y'all ain't hear what I say. I, my God. I can't rebuke a spiritual law, but I can operate in the other spiritual law that covers me while I'm receiving the other thing. You got to learn how to operate in that loophole in Christ because there's a lot of loopholes in Christ. I'm not under the law. The law of Christ is the Holy Ghost. You ain't got to talk to me. I'm, my God in heaven. I've learned that when I learn God, I learn how to get through life. Somebody say, I know him, so I will win. Lord have mercy. Take notes right here. Take notes right here. Affliction should produce endurance, improved character, and hope within us. Affliction should produce endurance, improved character, and hope within us. I'm going to bring you to that point. James chapter 1. Thank you, Lord. James chapter 1. Uh, CSB. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Whew. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jeremiah, I'm so grateful to what God is doing. So grateful. James chapter 1, verse 2. CSB. If you're there, say amen. amen. Okay. I'll let a couple more people get there. James chapter 1, verse 2. CSB. Is this good? Y'all yeah. learning something? Yeah. Amen. First two, if you're there, say amen. amen. It says, consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full what? Its full what? Full what? Wait a minute. Full effect does not mean half effect or one fourth of an effect or one third of an effect. And I can't get the full effect unless I get through the thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Shaquille, I like Six Flags. I don't go out of town because I don't like it that much. But I like Six Flags. And I, can't, and I can't really experience the park unless I experience the whole park. So if somebody say, have you been to Six Flags, but I only rode two things and only been to two parts of the park. I can't really say if Six Flags had its full effect on me. If I go through adversity and I'm immediately running out the furnace, I can't really say it had its full effect on me. Because I went through the tribulation, but I ran out of the furnace before I was perfected. Some of you keep experiencing the same thing because you keep running out the furnace. But this is what you forgot. You can't get past this point till you go through it. Lord, have mercy. You, Lord, have mercy. See, there's some things you can't escape. I, it, it will. It will find its way back to you because it's attached to you because it's a part of your story. Lord, have mercy. You can move to a whole other state. Shoot, you can get a passport, stamp it, and move to another country. But you will find yourself in that same scenario again. And when you get to it, you're going to say, God, what happened? And he's going to say, you never let me perfect you in it. So you have to come back to it. I want to talk to you right here. There were times when Jesus would rebuke his disciples, and they weren't listening, and they found themselves in that scenario again. Notice what I'm saying to you. Lord, have mercy in here. Peter got rebuked. Lord have mercy about his feelings before Jesus died when Jesus was next to death he had to experience what he told Jesus he shouldn't have been a problem with because he didn't believe what God told him he didn't receive that perfection there so he found himself denying Jesus even though he was told to him that he would that's what happens when you don't submit to your process but oh Lord have mercy but after you do the two and find out I messed up and come back and repent you 
get restored just like Peter and he'll ask you stuff like, do you love me? And your response is, you know I do. And then he said, feed my sheep. In other words, teach them what not to do because you went through it. Somebody say, I'm teaching from my tribulation. Glory to God. <laughs> Glory to you. Lord, have mercy. Let me break down various trials to you. We're talking about, let me go back. Verse 4 says, let endurance have its full effect so that you may be what? Mature and complete, lacking what? Nothing. That's it. When we're talking about various trials, let me show you an example of a various trial. Let's say you short-staffed at work. Let's say you work at a warehouse, and you, and you, and it's usually eighty y'all on that assembly line, and the day is full. And and today just happened to be day y'all got the biggest order from that eighteen wheeler, and it's four y'all now. Y'all struggle with eight, but now you really struggle. You got four. That's a try. God didn't tell them people to call out. Hear what I'm saying, please hear me. God didn't tell them people to call out, Prophetess Baker. They called out on their own. God didn't tell that truck to give you the biggest order. That was already a part of the program in the earth. But what's going to happen is God's going to test you through your trial that came because he's going to perfect your character through it. So it's either you're going to do one of two things. You're going to start snapping because they ain't working good, or you're going to ask God to help you be Christ-like in the midst of being short-staffed and teach other people how they should maneuver in the midst of adversity. What I've learned about adversity with me is that if I learn to properly maneuver in it, I can teach other people how to get through it too. And Lord have mercy, because it ain't about me, it's about us. Lord have mercy, because look, look at me, look at me. If I'm short-staffed and they ain't listening, I Find an effective way to communicate so we can get the job done. Because with man, it might be impossible to get these orders done before we clock out. But with God, all things are possible. We're talking about God who gave me a brain that came from his brain. A God who gave me a work ethic that came from his work ethic. That same God can tell me how to communicate to slow sap and help her speed up or put her in a position where she say stuff instead of do stuff because her mechanical skills ain't that great. You got to put people in the right place. See, when you start moving according to Christ, you move apostolic. So if you ain't good at unpacking, then I'm going to put you in putting stuff up. And if you ain't good in taking a pallet and breaking it up, then I'm going to make sure I put you on the assembly line. I'm going to put you where we're effective, not where we need numbers. Because numbers don't always equal success, but true effectiveness does. Y'all still with me? You got to get perfected even when things happen that you didn't expect. Huh? You don't expect nobody to call out, but they're going to. You don't expect them to cut you off in traffic, but this is Atlanta. They're going to. You don't expect to be late to work, but if you drive on 400, there's a wreck waiting to happen. It's going to happen. And how you respond to these things perfects your character. Stay with me. Romans 8.28 says, God causes all things to work together, right? All things, meaning that he sees it before it happens, but he allows it to happen so that it can perfect you. He didn't orchestrate it, but he's going to use it. He's the ultimate opportunist. You hear what I say? Listen, my baby in the back sounded beautiful. Now, take notes right here. How I respond to my process determines my perfection. How I respond to my process determines my perfection. And let me give you this. We have to reassess our heart posture, our perspective. The Bible says when the trials come, you're supposed to count it all joy. Right? Think about that. Consider it a great joy. Consider it a great joy. How am I supposed to be happy, man of God, when trouble happening? What that look like? Most people would say something wrong with that joke, brother. I mean, that joke is crazy. He happy because trouble came? I'm not happy because trouble came. I'm happy because I understand what happens when trouble comes. Amen. Hear what I say. Let me show you why. Because when trouble happens, the power of God has an opportunity to work ever so freely in you based upon how you respond to it. Listen to what I'm saying. The Savior can't come if there ain't no world that needs saving. Samson don't need to get that supernatural strength unless he need to slay the enemy. Moses don't need to part no Red Sea unless they're on the run from the Egyptians. When trouble and adversity arises, the power of God has an opportunity to go off in your life. 
People can see that God is in your life. You, Lord, have mercy in here. So you ought to get glad because if the devil tries you, that means God about to do something major to put the devil to shame. Lord, have mercy in here. I'm talking about, I'm considering a great joy. Nehemiah 10 a says, what do we need to know? The joy of the Lord is our strength. When you feel weak, just start getting glad. Ask God to deposit the fruit of the spirit of joy in you in a different dimension. Ask God for supernatural joy. The type of joy that they had, you just smiling and giggling in the midst of adversity. And they trying to figure out what's wrong with him. I got the joy of the Lord. And that's what strengthens me. So while you over here being weakened by your sadness, I'm being strengthened by my joy from on high. Somebody say the joy of the Lord. Break this down to you. Verse 3 says, consider the great joy, my brothers and sisters, when you experience various trials. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. You know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. That word endurance in the Greek is the word hypomone. And it means, listen to this, it means the power to withstand hardship or stress. Did y'all hear what I just said? Endurance is the power to withstand hardship or stress, meaning you're able to stand against it. But it's power, Marvin. You see, it says in verse 3, testing of our faith produces endurance. What it's really saying is the testing of our faith produces power. Your process is producing power if you let it. It's not there to kill you. It's there to strengthen you, actually. It produces power to withstand your hardships and your trials. Watch this. And then it says, verse 4, let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Let me show you this. A mature Christian is one who allows the fruit of the Spirit to be seen and displayed in them in the midst of all scenarios. Hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. You mature as a Christian in good times and bad times. The fruit of the Spirit is grown, it's not given. Listen again. The fruit of the Spirit is grown, it's not given. Gifts are given, but fruit is grown. The gift reveals the power of God that has been given to you. But the fruit reveals the transformation of God that you are moving in. The gift may give you power in certain scenarios, but it won't help you get out of everything because it's only one facet of the wall. But the transformation of your character producing you to be in the image and the likeness of Christ will produce a good effect because everything that Christ is, you now are. Please stay with me. So when things happen to Jesus, he didn't miraculize everything. Some stuff he had to go through. He could raise somebody else from the dead, but he couldn't stop himself from having to die because it was a part of his process. Y'all. If we rely on the gifts and the power of God, we'll miss the process of God and be power seeking people that might as well be in the witchcraft and the occult because they got power too, but they ain't got no good fruit. Listen to me. Can I show you something? When Egypt was confronted by Moses, they duplicated three out of those ten plagues. They have power too, but they ran out of power. That's what it looks like for a Christian who doesn't allow Christ to transform them. The power you have can only go to a certain extent. Then you run out of power because you're not producing the character of Christ. And the character of Christ can produce any of the gifts. See, y'all weren't ready for that. See, my God heaven. Just because I have the gift of prophecy doesn't mean I have the gift of interpretation. But if I steward the gift of prophecy by allowing Christ to transform me, the gift of interpretation will show up when I need it because Christ will allow me to get what I need to get out of my storm. Say, Lord, have mercy in here. I'm not a power seeking Christian. I'm a fruit seeking Christian because fruit transforms you. Power maintains you. But the power is only good for when you're able to use it at. Y'all hear me? Y'all okay in here? Yeah. Somebody say we need fruit. And tribulation produces fruit. Look, we go through processing to obtain what Christ has and is because we abide in him. Watch me. I abide in Jesus. So everything he went through, I go through. My goodness. Christ has all power. Listen to what I just said. Christ has all power. Somebody say all power. all power. But all power was given to him because he properly stewarded his suffering well. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says because he humbled himself, 
to the, 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 the humanity to be able to suffer like that of a slave and did not conceive equality with God to be something he grasped onto or held onto. Because of this, he was given a name above every other name. The power that Jesus holds is because he stewarded his suffering well. If you don't go through your process, you can't get the next level of power you need. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Adversity is necessary because it produces the character of Christ that enables you to receive the new power you need. Listen to me. My closing passage is Philippians chapter 3. Write this down as you're turning. Philippians 3 verse 10. Don't forget. Philippians 3 CSB still. But in order to obtain the power to overcome adversity, we must obtain it by being processed just as he was. In order to obtain the power to overcome adversity, I must be processed and obtain it just as he was and just as he did. After Stuart suffering well. Philippians chapter 3 CSB. Philippians chapter 3. This is my closing passage. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 10. We're going to read to about verse 15. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. If you're there, say amen. amen. The writer writes, My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his what? I'm trying to help y'all, Marvin. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help the saints. I said, when it says my goal is to know him. Whew. I just felt the Holy Ghost hit me heavy. You don't really know God unless you go through suffering and find him in that. Because if you know God absent of tribulation, you don't really know God. You know one portion of God. You need to know God in all areas of life, even when it gets hard. I'm talking to you in here. The secret place God you know can't be the same God you know when you go through adversity. You got to find God on the backside of the mountain the same way you found God in the midst of the mountain. Oh, Lord, have mercy in here. It's easy to find God in church, but it's hard to find God during the work week with every co-worker. You got smokes and cusses and does everything that's adverse to the Bible. Can you find God and know God in those settings. When you really know God, you learn him through the fellowship of his suffering. God wants you to know him. The writer said, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Watch me. He knew that he was not able to obtain true knowledge of God, nor power from God without going through suffering. You can't skip the steps. This is a bundle package. You know how you can call a company and say, I want cable, I don't want your phone service? That ain't how I work in the kingdom. If you get power, you got to go through tribulation. You got to be able to know God, come to know him, come to get the power, and receive the fellowship of his suffering. You can't, this is a bundle package. If you don't buy it all, you can't buy it. Lord have mercy. Somebody say, we need it all. He says, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed, being conformed, being conformed to his death. Romans 12 says, be not conformed to this. Well, let's exegete the text. In other words, be not conformed to this world. Instead, Philippians 3 says, be conformed to his death. Meaning you got to die to yourself. You got to die to your flesh. God ain't asking you to commit suicide. God asking you to kill your fleshly nature. You got to die to you because you is not the image of Christ that he made you in. Hear what I say? The new you is what produced and abiding in. That's what you abide in when you kill your flesh. When you don't kill your flesh, the new you is overpowered by the old you. Life has a way of resurrecting the old you. People have a way of resurrecting the old you. We'd be like, I done changed. Yeah. To that right person to say the right thing. No, you come out fast. Let me tell you something. It'd be like a whole transformation. I'm a Christian, but I cuss sometimes. And you don't want to. No, no, no. That's old you. That got to die. I ain't never in my life seen so many Christians glad they cuss. They told it like a, they told it like a badge. I cuss. Why? You still old nature. This new nature is supposed to be in you now. The Bible says, let no filthy communication come out of your mouth. Lord, have mercy in here. People be quick to tell me, I fight. Okay. And what? 
So what? Some people fight, some people shoot. You might run up on a shooter. Somebody might got made, she'd be blind swinging in the air. What you telling me that for? You ought to be telling me how you fight the flesh. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, Jeremiah. I'm not saying you run up on my wife and my children, I won't knock your tail out. Because I'm a protector and a provider, and that's biblical too. But I'm not inciting fight. No. That's Bible, yes. But guess what? I'm not going out here looking for fights or that be my response to things I don't like. Because if that's your response to things you don't like, you're immature. Somebody say it's time to mature. You got to doubt of that. Doubt of that I'm a fighter. The south side of the kingdom, there ain't no such thing. It's just the kingdom. Amen. And if it is a south side, west side, east side, they all look the same. They all pure. I promise the south side don't fight better than the north. We all fight. The reason we did is because we beat the devil. Hold on, Lord have mercy. I'm just telling you. Just telling you. We, we all fight. I fight. I fight too. The devil can't lay a hand on me because God is with me. Amen. It says, my goal is to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow, my God, somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead, meaning the way I live here guarantees me getting there. <laughs> Not that I have already reached the goal or I'm already perfect, but I make every effort, somebody say every effort. To take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. When God really get a hold of you, he transform you. You can't even move the same way. You hear what I say? When God really get a hold of you. See, if God get a hold of you, then he is able to help direct you and lead you into truth. But if God ain't got a hold on you, then when God tell you to do something, you be running. Hey, hey, hey. You see, God is a father. Yeah? Jesus the shepherd, ain't he? Some of us like that little sheep that like to run across the gate. You run across the fence. You like <clears throat> coming under the fence, like let me go explore. <laughs> that ain't letting God get a hold of you. He's having to chase you down to get a hold of you. Right? But when God got a hold of you, you stay in formation. You stay in the safety of the shepherd's grasp. Because he's transforming you into the image and the likeness of himself. So it says, I make every effort to take hold of what? Of the resurrection from the dead, and my goal of being perfect because I have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal, the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who are mature, somebody say mature, think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. What's he saying? He's saying, I ain't perfect. I'm reaching for perfection. But if I'm reaching for perfection, eventually I'm going to obtain it. And then we say, he says, forgetting what is behind, reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Let me say this to you. Your salvation is secure because Christ is secure. But you must run the race with endurance in order to make it to the end. When we talk about making it to heaven, it's not a salvation issue. It's an endurance issue. I got to exegete. The Bible doesn't say he who is saved makes it to the end. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Christians arguing about salvation. We're not arguing about you being saved. We're making sure you got enough endurance to make it to the end because there's something greater that's coming that will try to deter you from making it. Are y'all okay in here? Y'all awake? Salvation ain't the issue, endurance is. Tribulation doesn't perfect your salvation, it perfects your character and your endurance. Isn't that what we're reading? Don't let nobody argue you down about, you can't lose your salvation. I don't think we were ever questioning that. I think we were making sure that we make it. 
Because our fruit needs to be relevant and evident of Christ transforming us. Because when he gets to the end, he has a thing to say. And he must say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Not depart from me, I never knew you. And you don't know people that don't look like you. You don't know people that you never spent time with and have communion with. You don't know people that don't have your best interests at heart. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. People that did you dirty, and you be like, if people bring that person name, you be like, who is that? <laughs> what you think Jesus do? You get to the end, and you don't represent him? You ain't looking like him? You be like, who is that? I didn't write it. It's the good book. So what I'm trying to explain to you, is don't let that be you. Make sure you run with perfection. Because I also have another scripture that says, he who is able to keep me from falling, mama, he's going to keep me. And that same Jesus is the one who strengthens me when I feel weak. Philippians 4.13 isn't a quote for me. It's a lifestyle. I make sure that wherever I don't have God, my God in heaven, I put him in. Wherever God don't seem present there, I ask him, show up here. Whenever I don't have instruction, I say, God, speak to me now. Because I understand that man does not live by bread alone when buried. He lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. As long as God is for me, tell me, my friend, who can be against me? So must we suffer? Absolutely. Because without suffering, we can't be transformed. Stand up on your feet. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every single person under the sound of my voice. I thank you for the endurance to go on. I thank you that you'll never leave us nor forsake us, oh God. You're with us even to the ends of the earth. Lord, I trust you. I trust that he who is able to keep us from falling, you will keep us. So help us to run this race with perfection. Help us to run and endure to the end so that we might be saved. Lord, I, I trust you. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my sheep. I trust that you won't abandon us. You said, Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. Lord God, we don't know everything about what's coming. But we do know that you're coming. And in that we find comfort and courage. Because you said you will face many sorrows in this world. But take courage. I have overcome the world. So God, give us that overcomer spirit. The anointing to overcome, the anointing to endure. The Bible says we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors through him that loves us. And God... I thank you for that more than enough anointing to be able to overcome adversity and then some. May we be transformed into the image and the likeness of yourself. And may we truly exhibit to the world that we are your sons and daughters by the way we live. I trust that you will protect us and keep us and let no hurt, harm, or danger come into it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen.